There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the one within all to another episode of Interverse. I'm your host, Chance, and I hope you're enjoying your beautiful, unique selves today, because no matter what your thoughts may sometimes tell you, the miracle of your existence is magical, meaningful, and magnificent, because you're a one-of-a-kind expression of the universal source consciousness. One thing that's always amazed me about humanity is just how different people can be from one to the next, even within the same environments and families. Ask anyone who's had children and they'll tell you that their kid popped out already pre-programmed with specific talents, preferences, and personalities, and even identical twin siblings don't typically share all the same behavioral quirks, despite being pretty much the exact same in their DNA and astrological configuration. I think it's probably not a stretch to assume that you all out there in the audience may also be fascinated in the fundamental fact of human heterogeneity, although probably not surprised by it. And the answer to where our innate attributes might originate from is probably already popping up in your mind. If you were to ask today's guest about this inquiry into individuality, I think she'd say that we've all been on a very long and strange journey, with one lifetime acting as just a single step upon our path through eternity. I'm talking, of course, about reincarnation. And though it may only be a theory to some, there are many people for whom reincarnation is a lived and confirmed experiential truth. Visiting Interverse for her first time is hypnotherapeutic healer and past life regression expert, Dr. Shelley Kerr, and she's the author of a brand new and wonderful book called Meet Your Karma, The Healing Power of Past Life Memories. In her new book, Shelley says that the goal of past life regression is to relieve suffering by changing the way that you view reality. I absolutely love that quote because the main mission behind Interverse is the exact same, to reveal that when you shift your perspective, expand your awareness, and see that your experiences in the world are mirrors of your innermost self, you can elevate past the suffering of life's many causes and effects and claim your power as Source Incarnate. In this episode, we're going to explore how karmic connections between our current incarnations and the vastness of our infinite pasts can create a complex web of forgotten trauma problematic eternal vows, and confusing or crazy compulsions that may be hindering us in our current egoic mission. In her book, Shelley provides several cases from her practice that exemplify the variety of ways that our mysterious history may have been holding us back, along with tricks and tools that we can use to cut the karmic cords for ourselves and finally close the circle on chaotic cycles we've been stuck in. This is a topic I've always wanted to get into on the show, and I'm excited to be finally exploring it, So if you want more context on what we're discussing today, please remember to check the show notes for a link to Meet Your Karma and to Dr. Kerr's website, pastlifelady.com, where you can get in touch with her for a private session and tour the awesome stuff on her website. And I wholeheartedly recommend that you do check out Shelly's book if you're curious about the hypnotherapy process and the success stories that she shares about her clients, because it's a very readable, practical, and enjoyable book with plenty of inspiration and instruction inside to help you elevate your level of self-awareness. And at the end of the day, practices that help us know ourselves are the most powerful things we can do. And if you decide you really like this episode and wish there was more, the good news is that there is. You can subscribe to Interverse Plus at patreon.com forward slash Interverse to get the extended version of this interview and access to the gigantic archive of double-length shows from the past couple of years. I think there's like a 100 now. I also want to welcome all of our new members from March and April and give a big thank you to everyone who's ever supported the podcast. It's great to see you guys signing up and tuning in to the great content we've been cranking out. And now it's time to take perhaps one of the deepest dives into the universe we've ever done beyond this lifetime and into the infinite. So let's get comfortable, take some deep breaths and prepare for the plunge with the past life lady herself, the technician of the timeless and soul soothing fixer upper of the psyche the incredible Dr. Shelley Kerr. Thanks for being here, Shelley, and welcome to Interverse. Thank you so much for that unbelievable introduction and belated happy birthday. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It was a pretty good one, despite the weirdness. So you are an Aries or an Aries Pisces or? I'm right there on the cusp. I kind of, 
identify with both, but really I like sidereal astrology that shifts everything over a few degrees based on the uh, procession of the equinoxes. And that puts me more firmly in the Pisces realm. I got like four planets in Pisces, but I don't know. We're all, all of it, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, we are. I'm the Aries Taurus on the 19th. So I'm on the other end. So just wanted to give you a shout out. Shout out fire signs. Yeah, there it is. All right. Yeah. But thanks for having me on the show. Oh, I'm really excited. I've been aware of your book for a pretty long time, although it only just came out. Thanks to your publisher for hooking me up. But I went ahead and bought a copy because I think this is one that needs to trend on the charts. More and more people need to know about what you do. And why don't you tell the good people who you are and how you got interested in past life regression therapy? Yeah, the past life regression and the idea that we've lived before and that we have been on a very long soul journey is something that I have been exposed to ever since childhood. There was a really famous past life regression book back in the 70s called The Search for Bridie Murphy. And at the time, the family and I lived in Colorado Springs. And so that's where this case actually originated from. And my mother had attended a luncheon with the woman who was the case study in the book, The Search for Bridie Murphy. And in this, I don't, this is kind of some of our listeners, I'm sure this is way before their time, but in the book, it was about this woman who was having really debilitating allergies and she tried typical medical science and everything she could try and finally went to a hypnotherapist. And so the hypnotherapist was just regressing her back to different events in childhood, trying to get to the source event. And he was making a certain degree of progress, but not enough. And then finally threw up his hands and said, look, I want you to go back to the source event of these allergies. And she ends up zipping back into this life in ancient Ireland where she was able to relay really intricate details about the little villages she lived in. And, and so my mother had attended the luncheon and heard this. And I don't know what normal people were doing chance at their family dinner table when they were a kid, but my mom brought the book home and we were talking about reincarnation. And the minute I heard this idea that the soul, this isn't the only time around it, that the soul goes on from here. It's just, there's something about it, even at that age just rang true to me and I became interested in it from that moment and then as an adult I basically had a friend pass away I I wrote a book called Life Stream that came out in 2003 that kind of talks more about this one but a friend of mine passed away in a hiking accident I was supposed to go on a hiking trip I didn't go and about a month after his death his spirit appeared in the window of my house and he had a very specific outfit on a white tank top and some jeans. And so many years later I was moved, I moved back to Colorado and I was living in Colorado at the time. And I started to sense that this spirit was coming back because of a lot of paranormal experiences that were going on at the time. And in Colorado Springs, it's very fortunate that there is literally a hypnotherapist on every street corner. And so this woman I knew said, hey, you need to go have a past life regression because it sounds like this guy has some unfinished business with you. And so I went to the regressionist and this is about after about nine years of going through all different kinds of, you know, talk therapy, going to the psychic mediums for, you know, different things, trying to find answers to this kind of burning regret of like, what would have happened if I had gone on the hiking trip? Could that have changed anything? And Nothing really ever got to the bottom of this deep cavern of despair that I had until I went to the past life regression because I was very easily able to go into three lifetimes where I had known this person before and it was just something about... I don't know, like in quantum physics, we know that like if we look at events one way and then we turn and look at events another way, it totally shifts the energy around certain events. And so just popping into these lives and kind of understanding the lessons that were learned, what the pa- seeing that there was a pattern where he had always gone very, let's say, un- in an untimely way that left me feeling a little bit strange about it. There was something that just, I don't know, just it flipped the switch and bam, I just felt better. And I said, this is really such a profound healing method that lots of long stories, like I said, but I had a near-death experience and then that's when I started channeling energy. And so through that, I started to 
understand that this is how I need to help people by providing past life regressions, but with the understanding that the thoughts that we have and the memories that we have about the past lives and experiences that we've had actually are things that can also occupy physical space in our energetic field. And so in order to make really profound shifts for people, they need to be talking about things, but more importantly, they additionally need to have an energetic component put in there where we actually move out the energetic component of past memories. And then through that, a lasting and life-changing and profound healing can occur from people. And so that's a long story, Chance, but it's uh, been a long journey, to say the least. Well, we got time for a long story. So that's a <laughs> <laughs> you talk about that situation in your book, and it was pretty amazing to hear just how big of a shift can occur from bringing awareness to the stuff that is, like you said, stuck in our energy field. Why do you think it's important to feel negative emotions in order to release them? You know, why can't we just will it away? And does ignoring them cause a type of pressure buildup in an unseen dimension? Or is that flow also rooted in the body? As I, I think there's definitely a component to how our physical health connects to these energetic blockages, whether it's from past life trauma or even current life trauma. It's something I've brought up before. I think it's a great point. I think there's a lot of reasons. I really theoretically believe, Chance, that it's probably not necessary for us to have these negative things happen, but unfortunately, and I, I'm holding my hand up and putting the mirror on myself first, um, we're lazy people, and sometimes we just won't do the work unless it starts to hurt. You know, we're just out of the beach or whatever we're doing or chillaxing, and we're not really too consciously aware of something, but when it starts causing discomfort and that discomfort transforms into pain, when that gets to the threshold that we can't deal with anymore, then we'll start looking into deeper answers. I don't necessarily think we have to go there, but typically we do. I had a, a weird experience about a year ago, the week of my birthday in 2019, I sequestered myself in a Buddhist temple I don't know if you've heard about Vipassana. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah, I've heard of Vipassana. It's a meditation. It's like an extended meditation, kind of isolated type of, uh, you do it with groups sometimes, right? But you, you're like in a, your own room. Yeah, there's, there's a, one of the biggest centers is south of Dallas. And through some weird twist of fate, I got into it. I, I kept applying for it, but I was never getting in. So I got in last year. And basically, you check in for 10 days of silence. You're kind of sequestered in there. You're going to do group meditations, and then you're going to go off by yourself and meditate. And that's all you're doing. And there's no dogma or rhetoric. It's just breathe in through your nose. But they want you to sit very still. And so there's a, it's a way to put a big flashlight on the thing that you're just talking about, which is when you sit very still and there's nothing else happening with you, it is going to get painful after a while. And so they want you to try to remain still and just observe, like if, if my shoulder starts to hurt, I'm just making that up, but then just sit there for a while and observe the fact that that, that condition cannot last forever. And so what I started experiencing as the 10 days wore on and the silence and the mind started to quiet down is exactly what I had always kind of known, but at a far deeper and more experiential level, but these thoughts they start to create a pain and that pain rises up to the surface of the body. And if we can hang on for a while, then I was feeling things just go whoosh and just kind of twist off of my body and create space there. And the Buddhists believe in this, in this modality that, you know, those thoughts are actual thought forms, like I mentioned before, that represent the karma that we're carrying through from past lives. And so with that, as I deepened through the week and through the meditation, like I, I would have like a past life memory would occur of, or I would feel like a sword came out of my back at one point and all kinds of really supernatural stuff was going on in there. And it just kind of reminded me of some of the things that I've been writing about unbelievably for 20 years about the fact that these things really are in the body and through meditation, through energy healing or mindfulness. I don't think people need to lock themselves up in the place for 10 days to get that. I think that 
I've tried to provide readers over the years with processes through guided imagery in these books that they can use to achieve these same things. But I definitely think there's something to that. And that part of what that teaching is showing people, that's kind of in alignment with what I'm trying to get across to my readers is the fact that, you know, all of us have challenges, but we can get through things and that there's no common condition that just stays the same all the time because life and the universe is a very dynamic place. And so people can kind of experience themselves kind of, you know, transforming and shifting consciousness through different processes and things that we go through. I love it. The shadow and the pain, although it is kind of unnecessary, at least in terms of how people typically react to it, it's actually our great teacher. It shows us what we're not so that we can let go of that. I actually wanted to talk a little bit about the energy healing component of what you do. A couple of years back, before I started the show, so it's like, I guess more like many years back, like six years, but I, I was uh, getting into crystals and I realized that I could sort of do like Reiki type work. It was just sort of spontaneously happening to me and I was really into it. But like the longer I went, I started getting more and more, I don't know, sick is the word for it. Not like a normal illness, but strange chronic pains in my body, like some energy fatigue stuff like that. And I was at uh, an event and walking around with a big selenite crystal in my hands and some random person who was, I guess, like a psychic and an intuitive person, I never even got her name, called me over to where she had a booth selling crystals. And she's like, what are you doing with that? And asked me about my my big piece of selenite. And I was like, I kind of have been playing around with energy healing, trying to help people where I could. And she's like, you need to ground yourself, man. And I was like, what? (laughs) And I guess she was picking up on some stuff that was stuck in my field. And she handed me a big chunk of black tourmaline, had me take off my shoes and walked me through a type of really brief sort of on the spot meditation where I connected to the earth and released a lot of the negative charge that I had been sticking to me from other people that I'd been uh, working on, for lack of better words. And in that moment, I literally felt painful places in my body that had been bothering me for weeks. I felt the pain like travel through my body, down my legs and out my feet and into the ground. And I was like, what is this? (laughs) So ever since then, I've tried to maintain a pretty regular practice of grounding, even though I'm not doing a lot of energy healing type work myself. I wanted to know if you've got a grounding practice that you employ. Maybe you could share with people how they can put that to use for themselves if you do, since you are doing a lot of energy work in conjunction with the hypnotherapy. Yeah. Wow. You just made me think of a lot of different interesting things with that story. I think it's a great story because anytime people are working with energy, there is the aspect to one, being an empath, which a lot of people are. We're picking up vibes from other people, even if we're not doing healing work on them. Sometimes we can feel the feelings of others. And so we do need to send those feelings that are not our own or whatever you want to call them, the vibes, the negativity, whatever it is, and ground that into the ground where it can be transmuted and transformed. Otherwise, we can literally, some of us, including myself, you know, can start acting out and going, you know, just acting like cray cray a little bit and then going, wait a minute, this isn't even my stuff. Where did this stuff come from? And the other thing you were making me think of is sometimes when we do healing work on ourselves, when we're not, you said you weren't feeling good, you know, people can get into I call that a healing crisis where just every time you're moving energy, you're shifting around the cells and everything. Then some of that, let's say it's toxins or maybe it's just vibes, unwanted influences, they start to come up and then that can kind of be scary because you go, wow, I don't feel good. But I think that people need to remember that like when you're working with energy, just to make sure you drink a lot of water. And I always talk about, like Epsom salt baths can be really good for cleansing out the the auric field and the energy so that we can start to get back in touch with like who we are versus not just picking up on other people's vibes and stuff. And so to your question there about an exercise we can do, usually in all, even in my hypnotic practice, 
I started realizing that I was going to need to ground clients because I live really close to a major interstate in Dallas, Texas. And if I have a client calling me in 10, in 10 minutes saying they're driving around, they can't find their way back to the highway, which is what used to happen when I was a new healer, then I know I got a problem. And that is, I have a problem because I failed to recognize when people are not grounded. And grounding is very important. So I started having people, and your listeners can do this too, where we just imagine acknowledging um, a beam of light moving through the top of our head. And maybe this is even a grounding. It's depending on how ungrounded they are. I either have them bring a white light or sometimes a brown grounding light through their head. Moving, we can do this right now, moving down, 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 down your neck, down your spine, moving into your legs, through your knees, your ankles, and down into the soles of your feet. And then you just start to imagine that you can feel the soles of your feet, their chakra and energy centers there, just opening up. And just imagine that you can send that brown grounding light down, 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 down into the very, very core of the earth. And just imagine that you can grow roots out of the soles of your feet and connect to the core of the earth and send all the energy that you're going to need to feel awake and refreshed. Keep that, but go ahead and send any excess energy now through that cord and send it into the earth, down, 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 down. And just imagine that you're sending this loving, healing, peaceful, vibrational energy into the earth and into all people, beings, living creatures, sentient beings, and all who occupy the earth. And then just you kind of almost feel a, oh, wow, okay, I've taken it down a notch, you know, and that's a really good feeling. I I think that people, I used to like to float around in the clouds and be up with the unicorns all the time, floating on a little Technicolor rainbow or whatever, and I finally have had to learn that, and I guess the Buddhist thing really kind of brought it home to me too, that they were teaching the fact that we have to be in the body, we have to remain grounded. And because when we get too far out there, that's when we actually don't feel well, even though it feels like we should feel well if we go out there, but we need to get back in our bodies and get grounded. So I think it's an amazing point you made. Yeah, yeah. And I'm right there with you. I spent a lot of time head in the clouds whenever I first kind of kicked off my spiritual journey. And apart from a large number of people just not even understanding me, and I wasn't, I had learned the lesson of like meet people at their level. <laughs> There's also what you said, it's not exactly healthy. I mean, the way I've heard it described is that if you are so far out of your body all the time, and that can be like, not just out, but really deep in inner space, you're existing too much on sort of the psychic plane. And that could almost send a signal to your body that I don't really need you anymore. Let's start shutting it down. I'm going to get out of here. (laughs) I like it better in uh, the cosmos uh, outside of outside of physicality. So if you want to stay in your body, definitely building up that positive relationship with it and giving it constant conscious attention. That is really, really important and helpful. But I'm really glad we got to do a little grounding exercise like that. It's definitely a good thing to do near the beginning of a show. I hope listeners can keep that kind of practice in their toolkit if they don't already have it. But to go back to reincarnation a little bit, not a little bit, I'm sure we'll go there a lot. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> There's a few explanations, though, that someone could use to theorize about what's going on with past lives. One is that each person has a life to life path in a type of linear order. Another idea is that each of us is actually the same consciousness at the innate level. And so we all will have and somehow already have lived every life that's ever been. And I guess another possibility is that a person's deep unconscious could make up a past life experience because it's being prompted to do so by a regression therapist. And it's sort of just symbolically answering the question of because the uh of what's wrong or why things aren't working in the current life do you subscribe to one of those explanations or have you seen cases that support something totally different or a possible combination of every explanation that depends on the subject i think there's validity to every single thing you just said in the processes that i use with clients 
I consider it to be, you know, I, I mentioned at the beginning of the show, I actually believe in reincarnation as a spiritual belief. But as I relate that to clients, I think of it as a process. And so as a process, therapeutically, let's just say I would go with the first explanation you gave, which is more of a linear line that we're going to go back into different events along some construct of a regular 3D linear time and our current understanding of it in a more 3D world. That said, I have also taken turns down the rabbit hole in working with clients who claim to be living in parallel universes where they're living simultaneously here as well as in other lifetimes. And I've written books about that as well. So I think there's that aspect. But when you're talking about like more of a collective consciousness as well. The thing about when I work with clients, I, I'm not here to judge where the subconscious material comes from. If I ask people certain questions, and to your third point about leading, I think it's very important not to lead people to the best of your ability, just to ask open-ended questions and let the client, I let the client go where they need to go. And within the realm of doing that, then subconscious material is going to come out. And so I would say that I can use my own intuition to decide whether or not, you know, is that really a linear past life they've had? Are they just tapping into the collective soup or some kind of an archetypal energy that's more prevalent in the wider society? Or are they simply regurgitating they saw something they saw on the discovery channel and, and really back to that bridie murphy story i told at the beginning, beginning of the show the skeptics and debunkers thought that she definitely had seen something on tv and she was just telling everybody stuff she saw on tv therapeutically whether it's any of those things or not i don't believe that a human being in this current reality that we are in as a physical being can consciously understand the vastness of this universe completely. And so I am not here to say like with 100% certainty what the correct answer is, but the truth would be as long as the material that's coming out brings healing and self-awareness and understanding to the person that can be applied to their current life journey to make their current life journey happier it's not as important to me to verify whether or not they just watch the Discovery Channel or whether or not this is an archetype or a linear past life. If I take them and ask them, okay, so you, you've told me about this story that happened in the 1200s. Okay, wonderful. So what happened there? They say X, Y, Z. Okay, great. Well, how is that story that you just relayed relating to the things that I'm doing here and now in my current lifetime? And they'll say, well, oh, you know what? I'm doing the same thing now. This is unbelievable. I can't believe that. Okay, great. Well, let's take the best and leave the rest. So if there's things we're doing that are nurturing and supporting a happy life journey, then let's keep those going. And if there's other things that maybe we can say, check mark, lesson learned, I'm done. Are we ready to be done with that lesson and just say, I've got that for now. And they go, okay, I'm ready to be done with that. And that's when we get into some cord cutting and healing. And so that they then can start to experience a happier now. And then one of the, now, as far as leading, I will say there is one place where I will lead people. And that is into the future because part of the journey involves my idea that if I go into a past experience, regardless of whether it's a real past life or just a dream imagery or a subconscious stuff I'm healing, I've come to some mental understanding of its healing. Then to test that out, I like to take people into the future. So because the future is filled with infinite possibilities, there's, there is a place in the future where you're happy and you're healthy and you're making this thing happen and it's wonderful and you're loving it. And so I, I do then lead them to a happy place where they can see the results of the work or the results of the thing that they let go of. Or sometimes people want to know about soul gifts. You know, let's say they discovered a gift. Well, let's go into the future where you're putting this all together. Because at the end of the day, I want them to come back from the journey. And if I can get them to believe that this future aspect that they saw of themselves, that this future wonderfulness 
is possible and they'll just take the steps that are needed to get themselves there, then I think people can make real transformations. Yeah, that was also something I loved about the book, the part of your process where you take them into a potential future. And then I guess you could say in like a magical way, but also kind of proven out by certain scientific researchers like Dean Radin, who studies the effect of uh, the present on the future, (laughs) that whatever you do, what you're describing there, it's like you're setting an anchor in the future that you're now sort of tethered to and synchronicity and even choices that you make that seem sort of automatic or unconscious can be leading you towards that future because it's what you've set in motion. I think that's really an amazing aspect of, of what you do. But real quick, I wanted to ask you about what your book on Parallel Lives is called, because that's pretty interesting and I might want to check that out. <laughs> yeah, it's called Beyond Reality, Evidence of Parallel Universes. And it came out in 2005. Awesome. How many books have you written? Oh, Lord, quite a few. Well, good for you. <laughs> like, I don't know, 20, 40. I don't know. I can't keep track anymore. What? Okay, I'm going to have to just like see the whole list whenever we're done here. But well done. <laughs> that That's definitely someone that's living their, their highest purpose right there. If, you, if you're able to crank out that much creativity, even if it's a lot research-based, you're still, you, you know, you're doing the thing. So definitely kudos to you. That's awesome. I, I have a book writing fetish. <laughs> So since we were starting to talk about the future thing, let's talk about the relief method. Maybe summarize it in brief because the book goes into more depth, but give people in the audience an idea of the sort of flow of how your process works and what they will actually be learning to do for themselves if they pick it up and decide to engage with the exercises. Basically, I wanted to come up with an acronym that basically describes the thing that I've been doing with clients for many, many years, because I've been working with people unbelievably for 20 years, which is shocking. And so I just created the acronym RELIEF that basically outlines the steps that we do. So the first thing people have to do through the processes in the book is we take you back to a source event where you're going to recognize the actual source event of trouble or challenge or whatever, or even a source event of good things. It's kind of like a weed in the garden. Like if I go out and just mow the weed off with a lawnmower, then it's going to come back in a couple of weeks. But if we want to get to the deeper root issue of something that is causing you know, in most cases, again, because we talked about earlier, most of the people who seek past life regression are doing so because there's something very challenging. So we want to get to the source event. So we need to make sure that we've arrived at the source event. And so the journeys in the book kind of guide the reader to discovering that. Once that's found, then you need to eliminate any angst. I briefly mentioned a minute ago this idea of cord cutting, whatever it is, that's what I call an unwanted influence. We can always imagine that we can use the power of our mind to disconnect us from unwanted energies if we just acknowledge there's a cord of light connecting me with this thing or this event from the past or this whatever. And we can just have, let's say, a guide. There's a whole section in the book that helps the reader get in touch with either a spiritual guide or a helpful angel. I like Archangel Michael myself. So let's say he comes by with a big sword and he just goes whoosh, and he cuts the cords between me and the unwanted influences. And then we do a healing light. We kind of use light and frequency. Like you're into the high level frequencies. We want to go from, like you mentioned a minute ago, go from where we're at, which may be down here and go lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter and lighter. And we're getting everything brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. And we're lifting it up using frequency and light so that it then is completely transformed. And then the final step is, of course, to go out to the future. Because when we can go out to the future and see that something brighter has occurred as a result of the work we've done in the past, then we know we've done the job. And that's it in a nutshell. I really liked that part of the book because it's something that you can definitely incorporate into your own personal spiritual practice. There's nothing dogmatic about it. It's almost like a scientific method of sorts and seems to be quite effective. Uh, I'd love to talk about a few specific case studies from the book. One is an interesting case for me with Deborah because she was required, I'm sure you changed her name, but 
Deborah, in your book, she was required to have more than just a mental shift to feel better. She actually had to communicate with her tormentor in this life who had no idea of their past connection. Can you maybe talk about that story a little bit as an example of this method? I love that you brought that one up because that's one of my very favorites to talk about. All of the case studies in the book, yes, the names have been changed to protect the innocent. But in the case of the one that I named Deborah, it's really interesting because over the course of many years, I have learned that there is much transformation that can occur in the theater of the mind. I can go back, I can imagine people, I can send them love, forgiveness, whatever, and then I can actually start to see, without actually speaking a word out of my mouth, I can start to see real transformation in the physical world as a result of something that I've done in my mind. But as you said, like with the Deborah case, what was so interesting, it's such an interesting case study during these times because it was about this woman who had a young son who was being tormented by a bully at school. And so the woman tried to talk to the kid's mother and they were like PTA moms. And you could just practically imagine these women just practically getting into a cat fight. The lady wouldn't do anything about her kid. You know, they're very upset. And so that really wasn't the full reason why the woman came to see me, but she put it into the list of things that she wanted to talk about because she said, look, I'm not a bad person, but there's just something about this mother, aside from the fact that this kid is being mean to my kid, but I just can't stand it. And this is, I'm I'm not acting like myself anymore. I don't know who I am. And so anyway, in the past life, she went into past lives where she had actually contributed to the death of this woman and her children in the past. And it had also been done to her. There was a whole pattern that was identified as we've mentioned throughout the show today. And so once she figured that out, we do a little of this cord cutting and putting light on it, just like we were talking about. And for a lot of people, that would be enough. Then they can kind of release the emotional charge and just say, you know, kumbaya, peace, love, and rock and roll. We're going to move on. All is well. But for some reason, like, because her guide was there, her guide was like, look, you need to actually go say something to this woman. Okay. It isn't good enough just to sit here in the session and just go through this in your mind. You're going to have to get up and go out there and take an action. And so she came back and told me, look, I'm getting that I actually have to go up and say something to this lady. I'm gonna, I'm supposed to apologize to her. And I don't even, you know, she did do some things. They did things to each other, let's say, in past lives. People can read the rest of it in the book. But she goes, this lady is going to think I am crazy, but I'll just see if I can and I'll just put it out there. So I con- she contacted me sometime later and she said this was crazy, but she went... She saw the lady in an event, and when she kind of had the feeling that it was okay to go up to her, she just went up to her and just said, she just tapped her and said, you know, I'm really sorry. And that's all she said. And then she just kind of backed up. And the lady, I guess, turned around, got tears in her eyes, and started practically getting ready to cry and just said, oh, my God, I'm so, so sorry. I'm so, so sorry for my child, and he's been horrible, and his dad and I are going through a divorce, and yada, yada, yada. And and just really like broke down and opened up to her in a really transformational way to the point where the two of them actually started having a, a real bond of almost, I don't even want to call it like, maybe they're not going to go to the mall and get their nails done, but let's just say very bonded together that she was even considering inviting the boy over to play. And I think that I love the story right now because there's so much of this talk about bullying in the media. And it's so detrimental, but I think that it's showing what we kind of should already know is that sometimes when people are bullying you, they there's something within them that needs healing. And usually these bullies are very vulnerable people and they're like big, hard eggshells that once you crack them, they just go all over the place and cry and, you know, have a big emotional charge. So I think it's a really interesting case study and I'm glad you brought it up. I love that one too. I think the armoring that people put around themselves psychologically, sometimes even physically in the form of excess weight or even an overly obsessive focus on fitness. I mean, not that you shouldn't be focused on your fitness, but when people get like, you know, you can take it too far. (laughs) There's, there's a real physical armoring, but also emotional armoring. We put on the tough exterior because we're directing And we may even be polite to others, but we're like uh, directing our anger inwards sometimes, as you touched on in uh, one of the latter parts of your book. 
But I really wanted to also highlight what you were saying about having conversations in our head, because I think that we've all experienced like someone that we're in a fight with or mad at, and we almost automatically, we have like a loop in our heads of, at least this used to happen to me all the time. Thankfully, I could say I don't do this anymore. And when I do, I catch it and I turn it around, but you'll like be thinking they would say this and then I would come back with that and bam and then bam. And you're literally having the argument with them in your mind. <laughs> and when I first got into meditation and started, you know, breaking free of the materialistic paradigm that I was stuck in when I was younger, I actually innately figured that out that I could turn the mental arguments I was having into conversations that went from fighting to forgiving and accepting and loving. I think that's a real thing. Like what I assumed back then was that I was speaking to the person's higher self. And even if they weren't consciously aware of it in this life, it would have an impact on how they felt about me just as much as it has an impact on how I feel about them. And even if you want to look at it on a purely physical level, if you do that practice and then you feel better and you're not focused on what's wrong between you and them, you're going to act in a way that doesn't put them off. So either way, spiritually or physically, that is a really useful practice to stop fighting in our minds with other people and start making peace whenever that does happen, like catch it in the act and turn it around. It's huge. That is huge. I think it's huge that you would even be consciously aware enough of yourself to stop yourself when you're having one of those circular arguments, because I've done that before. And I think a lot of people probably do. And it takes a lot of awareness to say, whoa, what am I doing? Who am I talking to? Where am I? And start to turn that thing around. So it's very helpful. (laughs) Yeah, I really love that. One thing I wanted to ask about was whether you think that some people carry heavier baggage than others and might have more of a need for regression therapy. Or do you think that everyone can pretty much benefit from it equally? Is it more almost like a break glass in case of emergency type of thing? (laughs) I like that. That's a good one. That's a good metaphor. I think you mentioned it earlier about the fact that, I guess I didn't really respond to it at that time, but I will now. The fact that potentially we've been all things before or, you know, this idea that we're all one. And I think though within that, that the way we each present ourselves in our present lifetimes could be presenting differently. So for some people, like people listening to your show, you know, we're all, I call us the woo-woos. We're kind of, you know, metaphysical woo-woos. We're into this kind of stuff. And so, so we are going to be more open to past lives and all the other things that you're fabulous topics that you explore on this show. And then I think other people, it wouldn't even be in their awareness or if it is, they're going to want to label it as something not good or whatever. And so some people, this, this won't really ever even enter into their consciousness, but those of us who are woo-woos, let's say, I mean that very lovingly, everyone. Okay. Cause I'm a woo-woo. I'm a first class woo-woo myself. I love me some woo Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. So I think for us, we have to kind of sometimes take a step back to those other people who we think don't have the same level of consciousness as we do, because we were probably in their shoes in a past life before, if we get into that level of empathy. So, but along the lines of what you're saying, I mean, is it break the glass emergency kind of stuff? I do think of the regression as something that is a tool. And so it's not, something that we need to be exploring over and over again. And usually even for myself, I haven't had a ton of regressions. I use it normally, like I mentioned earlier, maybe I'm in pain or something. I mean, just like everybody else, I use it as a tool to find an answer to a question if I simply can't get answers elsewhere. But I think like any tool, it's pr- that one is probably one we use more sparingly than others. And that some people won't even resonate with it. Some will. And definitely to answer that other question you asked, do some have more emotional baggage? I think they must. Yes. I think that what's weird about life is that some people are wearing their karma and their emotional strife right out on their shirt sleeve where everybody can see it very openly. Maybe they have a physical handicap or maybe just X, Y, Z, any things that is very glaringly obvious to the rest of us. But some of us, let's say it's not as immediately 
obvious what we might be struggling with, but but all beings do struggle with different things. I'm one of those people actually, like, I think it might be the Piscean vibe, but I'm able to just sort of like isolate and hide my personal problems. And on the exterior, I seem great all the time. And generally speaking, I am great all the time. Don't get me wrong, but things that I don't like about myself, it's like almost impossible for me to bring it up to another person and be like, look, I'm having this problem and I want to change it. And it's just like a lot of pressure on me to figure it out all alone. And so it's, there's ups and downs to that type of personality trait. I think I've got some of that too, because I've been really an eternal optimist to the point of having rose colored glasses on all the time and really not even wanting to acknowledge that negativity exists. And after a certain point, you have to finally, as I've gotten older, and I don't want to say more mature because I'm still very immature, but I think I've probably come to understand that it's okay for me to admit that maybe I'm not feeling as optimistic every single day of my life. You know, maybe it's okay to know that that's why we meditate, you know, so we can bring a peaceful stance. Cause I'm also like that too. I'm the one that needs to be positive so everybody else can be positive. And sometimes I've noticed people who I would consider my friends, they don't want to hear from me if I'm not in a great mood, you know, and that, that gets to be kind of old. So I've had to kind of work it out on my own as well. I think now I'm probably more okay with admitting that, you know, I don't always feel positive all the time. I just don't see how somebody could, even though meditation and things and the things that are hopefully in this book to help readers help us to feel calm and happy as much of the time as humanly possible. But I just don't think it's possible to feel that way 100% of the time. It's natural. Kind of like I was saying before, the shadow and the pain, they're there to teach us and Life would be completely one-dimensional if we eliminated it. That's why I'm super skeptical of people <laughs> in, a, in our woo-woo tribe that want to say that they have like the magic key to completely eliminate challenge and suffering from your life because I'm, I'm very like, well, if we did that, then what's the point? It's, it kind of ruins the game. I don't think anybody can claim they have the magical key to anything like that. I think... The Greeks believed that the soul dips into the river of forgetfulness before it incarnates in a given lifetime because we're here to remember our divinity, to remember who we are. But within that, we do learn through challenges and we learn how to overcome. And so you're right, it would be boring and one dimensional. I have a question about the trauma or karma that we carry from life to life. Does it skip over lifetimes sometimes and wait to reemerge until later in the person's incarnations where it's more, I guess, like potent or impactful? Or is it pretty much a sure thing guarantee that if we don't finish healing something in this life, it's going to be at the forefront of our challenges until we do? Well, that's a great question. Again, I'll say that this all of the things we talk about are my theories, but as a human being, these theories may be disproven once I get to the place where we're all going to be going one of these days. But from working with the clients over the years, there is, let's just say, if, if somebody comes to this work, if they come to the idea that they potentially feel that they need a past life regression, there's something in their consciousness that wants to do that. So therefore, when they go back on this linear kind of process, whether they use the processes in the book or they come to see me or whatever, they're going to start identifying usually at least a couple places along that linear timeline in the past where they can pinpoint pieces of the puzzle that is leading to their current life challenge, which would then suggest that perhaps this karma that they're carrying has been replaying itself in their past lives. Again, if those are actually real past lives, because again, it cannot be proven, but there must be some aspect though to the fact that the consciousness in the current lifetime, because we are so much more advanced in terms of having the energetic space to be having really deep philosophical conversations like the one we're having now. But let's say in the 1800s, you know, I'm out on the farm. I mean, I'm struggling to survive. You know, the tornado just came and knocked my barn over or something. I mean, I'm just, you know, obviously making all of this up. But you know, if I'm in kind of survival mode, which are really interestingly, a lot of the case studies in Meet Your Karma really are about people who are 
in real survival mode and they're struggling. And so therefore they wouldn't have the consciousness because there's a hierarchy of needs, which I'm sure you've already explored a thousand times on the show about, you know, if I've got food to eat, then I can talk about having a roof over my head. And then once we go up that hierarchy, eventually I can get to the idea of thinking about like all the emotional triggers that cause me to not feel secure or whatever. But if, if I can't get my barn put up and the cows are loose, I mean, I just don't have time to think about that. And so I think it has to do with the period of time that we're in. They might have been, but but that I really do think that, yes, there there's definitely in the least leading way that I can, because I really try not to lead, I know for a fact that souls will identify a couple of places, sometimes maybe tons of different places in past lives where they were energetically doing the same stuff that they're still doing now. And by simply identifying the pattern, they can finally be rid of it. And the idea would be, yes, that hopefully we're getting some learning so that when we come back the next time, that we don't have to do this again. And of course, everybody wants to act like, well, okay, if I get it right, does that mean I don't have to come back? You know, I, I maybe they do, maybe they don't. You know, maybe they want to go float up in a different planet where they have love and light all the time. You know, the one that I used to live on. Maybe we don't have to do anything. Maybe it's always a choice. Exactly. Oh, that's another whole ball of wax. Yes, I've taken people into this space where they can talk to their higher power right before the moment they incarnate in this current life where they get to figure out, well, what, what was it that I was supposed to be doing in this current life? And, the, and their higher power, however it is they perceive that, will start to lay down the roadmap for what they chose in what I call, like to call like before I arrived with the idea that maybe I chose this. And, and I think that's been, I want to hear what you think about this. I think it's been very controversial when I try to say to people, hey, I think that we probably signed up for some of this crazy stuff. Because they go, wait a minute, I didn't do that. Somebody mentioned this to me years ago. They said, well, you know, you're causing all that. And I was like really bent out of shape. But as I kind of evolved into thinking about, well, what if I did cause it? Then that means if I caused it, then maybe I can do something about it and I can change it. Because I think like if people feel like they don't have any control over things, it kind of gives the mind a way to think about restructuring things to think, well, maybe I did. And so could I get into a state more where I'm more thinking about what I learned by something, even if that something was horrible, did I learn something that is making me feel more expanded and helping me grow as a human being? It makes me feel better than just to think that I'm some victim and all this stuff is happening to me all the time. So I've used it as an empowerment tool for my personal self, but not everybody probably wants to buy into the idea that maybe we signed up for some of this stuff. So what do you think? I'm just curious. Oh, I like to be right in the middle. I think it's a <laughs> little bit of this, a little bit of that, because of course you wouldn't want to tell a child that was abused. Well, you were asking for it. I mean, that's not going to work. Well, no. But you could still possibly be looking at a situation where in a past life, that child was an adult who abused the adult in their current life that caused them problems. I mean, it, it's hard to know and even pretty difficult to verify one way or the other. I think overall, it's better to probably lean towards the side of we're choosing all this. Yeah, maybe there's some people in situations in our lives that do stuff to us that we really didn't intend to happen. And that's their free will acting upon our bubble a little bit and maybe on the deepest level it's one consciousness that orchestrated the whole play and that's you in a sense but it's not your current you completely so i think it's okay to look at certain things as having happened to us with the recognition that we did know going in the major stuff that was going to go on to shape us and probably agreed to it to some level whether or not we knew exactly what it was going to be like even the really horrible, really difficult stuff. Because like you said, that's like the most fertile ground for growth. The best way to look at any difficult situation is this too shall pass. You should also probably look at positive situations with a this too shall pass attitude because we're always going to keep on going. But uh, <laughs> I guess like to go into the confirmation side of thing. Have you seen any research or made any discoveries yourself that verified specific details of a patient's past life regression through historical data? Historical data hasn't really been part of my practice because my main goal is just to help people find 
greater peace and happiness. So I haven't really dug into any of that. I'm glad that some have, though, because I think it brings a level of validity to the practice of going into past lives that makes it easier for people to realize that, yes, this is real. Some of the famous case histories, but that hasn't really been a part of my practice, no. Well, it is out there if anyone wants to go find examples of it, particularly more so in cultures that have a widespread belief in reincarnation. Like I think you can probably find a dime a dozen cases from India where a child was like, yeah, I used to live in this town and this was my name and that's my mom. And they may have even gone and visited that family and been like, hey, here's your son from a previous life who died early. They're now our son. Stuff like that. I know I've heard of it tons of times. So while it's still not complete proof, it is pretty unlikely that a child would just make stuff up like that. And children do seem to have a closer relationship to that in-between state and the things that came before. It's like the river of forgetfulness isn't something that you metaphysically take a bath in so much as the conditioning that you experience and the world around you telling you this is who you are, that's all you are, maybe closes you off to some of that stuff. And it could have to do with the way chakras develop over the first seven years of life as well that sort of seals that environmental self into a more solid and permanent state. But I wanted to talk about also using the imagination as a source of real information. That's kind of where I was going with that first question. Do you think practicing hypnotic states and trances can help us get a sharper intuition to be able to ask ourselves like basically any question and have answers automatically pop into our head, sort of the same way that regression images do? I have a friend who is sort of able to do that exact thing. I don't know if I could ask him like the square root of 365 million, but generally speaking, I I have witnessed people who are able to uh, just sort of ask the question internally and hear an echo of an answer back. And I think even myself, I've been able to do that. It's sort of like that old adage about a multiple choice test. The first thing that comes into your head is probably the right answer. First of all, I agree with everything you said a minute ago. Yes. Secondarily, the power of the imagination is critical to success in regressions. And I think it's really... For me, anyway, I feel like it's critical to being successful in life in terms of, yes, being able to tune in. We have so many questions, you know, why are we here? What should I be doing? And different things like that. And I think that the answers really are within ourselves if we can quiet ourselves down enough to receive those answers. And so I always talk to people about the fact that, like, in the journeys that I do, or let's say what I've asked the reader to do in Meet Your Karma, for example, is to get a little recording app and go ahead and just read the little script that I give you and then just play it back to yourself. And so within that, you're really not in some deep level hypnotic state where you're not going to remember what happened when you come out of it. You're just kind of, it's almost like listening to a little guided meditation CD where I'm your meditation CD and I'm going to ask you a few questions. And just like you described, I'm going to ask you to acknowledge the first random thought that seems to be floating up into your consciousness. Just go ahead and get that out and acknowledge it. Because I think we do have flashes and thoughts, but we've trained ourselves, like you were saying, with closing down the chakras and just getting entrained with this idea that this is who you are and you're nothing more. That over the years, we've learned that maybe that random thought floated up into my mind but that that sounds silly and it seems ridiculous and so I shouldn't go with it but I'm really asking people to do the exact opposite of that so if something seemingly silly floats in it's floating in the same way a dream image would float in so let's just go with it and let's just acknowledge it and see where it goes and if I can get people to do that then they can come out with real transformational answers to the questions that they have because really the processes through regression is really I'm just asking questions the person is providing all of the answers through that higher self aspect of themselves that is being illuminated through them allowing themselves to tap into the more imaginative parts of their nature 
that maybe they have shut down over the years and that I feel really needs to be reawakened in order to achieve more happiness in life. I think it's critical. I couldn't agree more. I actually say it all the time. I guess you would call me an idealist in terms of philosophy. And that would mean that the universe is a mental construct and that imagination isn't a type of thinking. All forms of thinking and all forms of perception are actually types of imagination or ways of imagining. So it's the primary thing. It's literally the source. And when you're connecting to your imagination in a pure sense with filters removed, as you can do through hypnosis, you're literally connecting to source. (laughs) That is, source and imagination could be considered to be the same word, at least in my personal philosophy, what I seem to have experienced myself. But I've definitely kept you past the allotted time at this point. So maybe you could give everyone the elevator pitch for Past Lives with Pets that's coming out soon. Let everyone know your website and how they can get a copy of any of your books and maybe tell them what they can do with you through an online connection as well. My website is pastlifelady.com and May 8th, my new book, Past Lives with Pets, is coming out. This is very fuzzy and fluffy and everybody will love it. It's about real life people who believe and discover during hypnotic journey that they have known their little fuzzballs in a past life. And so there's guided exercises in there. The most healing ones are about helping people with grief over the loss of their pet, like your partner, what happened. I mean, there's nothing as heartbreaking as losing our pet. We know that. And then just different journeys to get in touch with animal guides, animal spirit guides. You'll read case studies of people who believe they were animals and then people who discovered their pets in other lifetimes as kind of a pleasant byproduct to some of the sessions. So that one's coming out. And then I've got a YouTube channel, Past Life Lady. I've got a lot of videos on the relief method, um, some of the some excerpts that I've read for you, and then I've I've got energy healing and all kinds of stuff. So they do, and the book link is on pastlifelady.com. If you just click on books, that's going to take them over to my books, and that's it. And I thank you so much. This has been a joy, Chance. I loved it. I loved it too. I feel like I learned a lot from the book, and then even more from this conversation. And also figured out more of what I think about things. And that's literally why I do this. I, for me, this is my uh, my hypnotic practice. I get into a, a trance with a guest and extract my own thoughts out for myself to examine. <laughs> so this has been a really good one. It's super fun to talk to you. I hope we can do it again. I'll be watching out for both of those books, especially the one about ancestral healing, because I think we're discovering how important that is in this very episode, maybe some of us for the first time. And yeah, I thank you for your time. I could talk to you for a lot longer, but I better wrap it up here. It's been a great pleasure to speak with you. I'm sure the audience loved this one and I cannot wait to get it out to them. Thank you so much, Chance. Just keep it going. This is wonderful. This is what needs to be happening in this world is getting this stuff out there. So good job. I loved it and I hope to come back. So many, many blessings. Well, it takes one to know one. (laughs) All right. Keep doing what you're doing for sure. It's really important stuff. And especially, I mean, you could just be a regression therapist, but you're combining that with putting these books out that can really help people and empower people. So yeah, I could keep the praise party going all day, but let's, uh, I guess we'll wrap it up. Thanks a lot. Well, how about that one? Definitely one of the most interesting podcast topics you could ever get into. I'm extremely grateful to Dr. Shelley Kerr for giving us so much of her time. And it sounds like she's been really busy. She claimed that she had written dozens of books, and I'm definitely going to have to check out some of the other ones. Always exciting to be able to talk to an author of a book that you read and enjoyed. So if you you guys out there, authors, or (laughs) know any that you'd like to hear on the show, send me their books or links to them, and I will check out some of that stuff. I'm always looking for material. And, you know, if I heard from the audience, the kind of things you guys want to hear, it might help me steer the ship in a direction that we're all happy with. Because I could go a lot of places with this podcast and be pretty happy about it. I would like to call myself a generalist. (laughs) I'm interested in a lot of things, a decent amount, and typically not completely focused on any one thing ever. I like to see how all the dots connect. 
And past life regression therapy does connect a lot of dots for us and a lot of the topics that we have discussed on the show in the past. And I actually tried it out for myself. I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. But to explore some of the concepts that were in this episode that I found particularly interesting was, first of all, the idea of negative entity attachment. This is one of those pretty much unprovable things, but that a lot of people claim is real. I'm not saying it's real or not real. In fact, a lot of the explanations that I give to things, I'm not necessarily trying to speculate on what a phenomenon is 100% of the time. I like to say theories about what things might be, and I can definitely be open to things being more than one thing (laughs) and having different variations, like the question of extraterrestrials that we got into the plus extension with, whether those are completely mental or actually physically real somewhere out there. And back to the negative entity attachment, there does actually seem to be a kind of link, at least in one of the cases in Shelley's book and other cases I've heard about elsewhere, between non-physical, almost like existing in the mental plane type of beings that are separate from our physical reality in some way, but able to connect with it and interface with it through our headspace, through our inner perception. And uh, when it comes to negative entity attachment, usually it takes a psychic to be able to tell you if something like that's going on. It does seem plausible that there could be a type of energetic parasite. There's parasites on all the different levels of reality that we can observe from the tiniest ticks to the fattest politicians. (laughs) But I also do like to come down on the side of all is self as a maxim because I really have only seen proof of that maxim, not any disproof of it. In fact, once you've seen the proof of it, you can't really disprove it anymore. I guess that makes it a kind of entrenched belief, but for me, it's more of an observation. And in the case of considering all things to be part of the same great, grand, universal source consciousness, super source, and that we are an extension of that and a spark or a flower budding off of that single tree, that would mean that anything that we conceptualize as separate does therefore become separate in a way that we create the barriers, we create the partitions and the compartmentalization of our own psyche, and that that can result in almost a type of inner schizophrenia. but. Hey, I don't know. (laughs) Like I said, it could be something more tangibly real, but at the end of the day, isn't it all still kind of coming from the same source that we are, regardless of if it's aliens or demons or angels? Any of these concepts, they come through our unconscious. That's the only way that we really tend to be able to access them. Fairies, spirits, ghosts kind of all in the same soup there. And everything's energy, man. That's why I think it's so cool that Shelly does energy healing with her regression therapy. Makes a lot of sense to me that you could combine those practices and maybe even kind of need to. And since we do have a lot more power through our psychic abilities than anybody realizes, in fact, it's not really anyone that thinks they're not psychic just isn't observing themselves being psychic It's like they've turned off a particular, they've shut the blinds on a particular perceptual filter and closed off any ability to understand it or witness it for themselves. But regardless of that, even if we can't perceive things on a psychic level very well, our intentions and the things that we do and that we say and the energy that we choose to embody and channel through us, those things have a reality regardless of how well we can feel them or perceive them. It's really just like humanity is in a, a, a quandary of lack of sensitivity. That's what I think. And that's why these past life journeys are actually so easy for people to take. They don't realize that you can go on a type of shamanic journey through inner space anytime that you want. And actually you do it all the time other than just dreaming. Daydreaming counts as this too. And we tend to think of these images that arise spontaneously in our minds and the imagination as being something out of our control, something mysterious and nebulous. But, and people will even say, I don't have a very good imagination. 
But the more you practice visualization, the better you get at it. And there is a skill to it, especially with something like remote viewing. And it's about not trying to interpret what you're seeing too much rather than just feel it and witness it and then maybe sort it all out after it's come through. But there is a fine line. There's a fine line. The left brain still has to be engaged to be able to do the observing. It just can't be so far tilted towards the left or right brain that you either A, begin creating the thing that you think you're seeing through your interpretation and changing the vision in a sense. Or B, being so lost in the clouds, as Shelley put it, that you don't bring anything back, that you're not paying attention. You're just floating there, maybe experiencing it, maybe feeling it, but not actually retaining it. And that's the way things go for a lot of people that do these types of psychedelic based journeys. You know, you can't bring a lot of that back or (laughs) DMT trips if you don't tell the story of what happened to yourself or write it down. Or tell somebody else within a few minutes, it could be gone as quick as when you wake up in the morning, what you're experiencing that night. But anyway, (laughs) I'm kind of getting off in the weeds here. I also wanted to talk about this idea that all of our problems were chosen by us before we incarnated, that we individually signed up for different types of challenges and difficulties, and especially typically these come through our relationship with other people more than any other way. Our relationship with the world, especially nowadays, is pretty easy. It's pretty easy going. No one's getting killed by lions that often, at least no one that I know. But the fact is, even if we have made a choice before we came into an existence that we were going to have a certain level of suffering as a teacher, a certain amount of pain to help us progress, that very well may be, we got to watch out for not letting that become an excuse for how we treat others. This isn't like to get all negative or call anybody out, but (laughs) maybe it is. (laughs) I've known people who were or who had the trappings of spiritual individuals. They, They wore the costume, but they could take very extreme liberties with other people, particularly in the And one of the instances I'm thinking of taking or borrowing things without asking, which is the same as stealing, even if you think someone is your close friend, which in this person that I'm thinking of, in this case, I would consider them my close friend. Taking my stuff without asking is pretty uncool. And anyway, this individual I'm thinking of had a big tendency of whenever anybody would call her out on something she was up to that was abrasive or uh, I guess a little bit um, unkind or outright exploitive of someone's trust, this person would like to say that you just need to work on yourself. What you don't understand is that the way that you're reacting to me is a reflection of your inner self and the work that you need to do on yourself. (laughs) So, you know, we can't let that idea that other people what they feel and experience is a reflection of their inner world. That may be true, but we can't let that be somehow a reason why it's okay for us to just do whatever we want to someone. That's totally missing the point. Yeah, we have these back and forth relationships, especially from lifetime to lifetime, it sounds like. You know, I kill you, you kill me, you murder my family, I set your cat on fire. I don't know. (laughs) hopefully I haven't been involved in in too many of those revenge cycles in my soul's journey, not that I'm aware of. But there is a, a point where it has to be about what we're doing and not about how they're reacting to us. And in fact, letting go of what other people think about us has nothing to do with walking all over people or doing whatever we want at the expense of anybody else in any way. That's totally missing the point. I probably don't need to tell you guys that, but let's not let it be a cop out because that's really a con artist type of perspective almost. Don't let it fly. And you don't have to, you know, get into a fight with somebody, but it's okay. And it doesn't speak badly about you if you need to move away from certain relationships because they take advantage of you. 
even people who seemingly are spiritual do have these type of behavioral problems. And in fact, some people that seem spiritual have dramatically bypassed a lot of important lessons. And, you know, there's a materialistic spirituality out there to watch out for. I'm sure I'm guilty of things myself all the time. But before I tell you about the past life regression that I did on myself, let me tell you about the plus extension for this episode. Of course, you've probably already heard me talk about Interverse Plus that you can get on patreon.com forward slash Interverse, five bucks a month. Gets you the entire archive of all the two hour episodes. And if you did happen to catch the plus extension of this episode, you heard us talking about the realization that pure imagination and the source of reality are actually the same thing. Love talking about imagination. We discussed a practical theory addressing the problem with beliefs in negative entity attachment or curses. I guess that that was in the uh, plus extension. So you probably, if you didn't hear the plus extension, you're like, why is he talking about negative entity attachment in this outro? Well, that's why, because it came up in the second hour of the show. We talked about cases of extraterrestrial contact, abduction, and soul contracts made with gray aliens with some of Shelley's clients. Fun stuff. Hypnotically incepted false memories and the way that our culture programs us for fear. How technology induces trance-like states and can influence and subvert our minds. Spontaneous past life recall and how it can be triggered and recognizing it when it happens. This was a really interesting topic because just the night before I did this interview with Shelly, I actually watched my partner go through a seem like a past life flashback to me. And it was pretty, I mean, not intense, like in a bad way, but there was a lot to it. And it seemed to me a lot like just what type of uh, things that people in Shelly's book were saying during their sessions. And in the plus extension, we also talked about Shelley's clients who believe they've experienced past lives in Atlantis. That was fun. We discussed healing our ancestral trauma and repairing the timeline of all of our ancestors' descendants, including ourselves. Exploring the space our souls inhabit between lifetimes. What's between life and death, huh? That's a good question. Guided journeys in Shelley's book were discussed and her tools that she shares to Help yourself do this type of thing, which I'm about to talk about because I use those tools. And we talked about creating a personalized happy place on the astral plane to use as a launch pad for your inner journeys. And that may sound like a lot of stuff because it was, but there is even more than that in the plus extension. I can only give you a summary. And if you like what I do, consider signing up for plus because, you know, if you liked an author's book, you'd buy their book, right? And I give you half of this for free. And overall, I won't need that many of you to be able to seriously start upgrading my process with the show and spending a lot more time on it. So if you want more faster, better researched and better guest episodes, maybe even more other types of side content besides the main show, the best way to make that happen is to start start supporting it. And it's not like you just support it for nothing. You also get a ton of extra content, literally twice as much. So. Don't know what you're waiting for if you like the podcast, but thanks to everyone who is supporting the show. Now, I guess I'll talk about my experience with the self-guided past life regression. Lucky for me, I've got good recording equipment and I just recorded myself reading some parts of Shelley's exercises that she details in the book and kind of making them my own, adding some stuff putting in the appropriate amount of spacing to let myself explore in between, I guess, like guidance promptings. And overall, it did seem to be about as real and as, I guess, perceivable as my experience doing a seance one time, which I've talked about on the show before, where I was like, a, I guess I was a medium <laughs> in a seance. Anyway, if you guys pick up Shelly's book, you can do the exact same thing I did, or you probably even just find a script or hell, I mean, you could pretty much just come up with it on your own if you're creative, like a guided meditation where you're taking yourself on a visualization journey to connect to certain things or connect to certain memories. I started off mine with meeting my spiritual guide in the uh, happy place on the astral plane, <laughs> my personalized little spiritual dojo. And 
if you guys listened to the last episode with <laughs> Heather Elizabeth, we talked about Gandalf the Wizard a lot, and therefore it came as little surprise to me that the guide that I met in this astral happy place was Gandalf. And before you guys are like, Gandalf's not even real. How's that possible? Well, this is a spiritual entity, part of my own inner self or higher self. So it can come to me in whatever form it thinks that I'm going to resonate with. And I definitely resonate with the form of Gandalf. I love that dude. It was just like the classic Sir Ian McKellen, Gandalf from the movie. <laughs> he talked to me about some stuff. I had a lot to say about the fact that I fear my own success and that I'm afraid of taking higher levels of responsibility because I think I might fail and therefore have nobody to blame but myself. But he put a healing light from the top of his staff, just like in the movie, right into my chest. And that was pretty cool because it helped me immediately uh, with solar plexus constriction problems I've always had. And, <laughs> you know, these have always repressed my energetic potential to a large degree. And I felt this lightning popping and cracking in my chest, in my solar plexus while I'm laying there doing this regression. And in my mind, Gandalf is pointing a glowing lit up staff into my chest. <laughs> yeah, I felt an immediate reduction in the constriction there. And the results of that went on for quite a while. I went with Gandalf into the past. I saw a freezing flood, but I couldn't go all the way back into that life for whatever reason. It seemed like maybe it was what people call Atlantis, but I have no idea. It was just like a a sort of fleeting vision. But I think in that life, I knew that the people in charge of things had screwed up. And maybe I died in a lifetime in that civilization from drowning, which could connect to a feeling of constriction in the lungs and a lack of full ability to breathe in later lifetimes. I think that situation made me not want to be at such a high level responsibility, maybe too, because back then, this, if the technology was so advanced, anyone could feasibly affect the world in a major way. And the ones who potentially caused the catastrophe of Atlantis, maybe me included in this set of people, were ultimately completely responsible and they thought they had everything under control, but then everybody died. <laughs> but I don't know. That was just some speculation I came up with after thinking about that brief vision of the flooding super city. And that was kind of all I saw of that. So I wouldn't necessarily call that a full on regression, but while I saw that and was thinking about it, I was getting this other information coming through with it. So I don't know, maybe I had a past life in Atlantis. Maybe, probably everybody did if it was a real thing. But the main life I went back into was France and the year 1311 was popping into my mind. I think it was February. I don't know. But I had a powerful desire in that life to protect my wife. So I was a guy, I had a wife, kind of a peasant type dude, I guess. Possibly um, this desire to protect could have stemmed from the original trauma of not being able to do anything about the flood that wiped out the super city I saw. Who knows? But Interestingly, the person was not the same as my current partner in this life, in the 1311 France. And in that life, I witnessed and experienced myself causing a fire by accident, and the home was burning. And I went in to try to save my wife in that life, and I'm not sure if I succeeded or not. Uh, but I just kind of fast-forwarded to the part where I died trying from smoke inhalation. I think that the fear of that failure made maybe had some effect on me going forward or this skull could all be symbolic and just a metaphor my subconscious is using of course maybe none of this is literally true that's okay this is just my experience of doing the regression but i think the fear of failure in both of those experiences definitely could have or the, the fear of the failure from both of those experiences could maybe have an influence on why i don't or why historically I've not wanted to operate at my full potential in this life. I don't want other people to suffer because of me screwing up while they relied on me, but I don't know. But the, the main connection was the smoke inhalation <laughs> method of death, <laughs> cause of death, and how that related to the solar plexus tightness and some other things that have gone on in this lifetime related to that and the lungs. 
on one level, I felt <laughs> maybe that I deserve to be inhaling the smoke because of causing the fire myself in this past life. So I don't know. At the end of the day, Gandalf helped me out some more <laughs> at the end of this session, showing me a future where I wasn't feeling this constriction in my chest. I, I can breathe better. I'm exercising more. I'm enjoying martial arts, which I don't do now. Interestingly, I saw myself doing that in a future in 2022. And I was rock climbing and I was feeling like peak physical condition. And um, there's a lot of stuff that I saw in this possible future. But that is one of the cool parts about her Shelley's method is to anchor things in with the vision of the future. And I, I don't know. I, Definitely been feeling different in some interesting ways since I did this about a week ago. Uh, you know, like other issues I've had around wanting to repress my own energy have seemed, I mean, it's kind of maybe kind of been up and down, but it seems like things are clearing up. And hopefully as a result, I can come across to everybody I meet is more genuine and maybe more unconsciously trustworthy feeling because I'm trusting myself more. But anyway, uh, 2020, there's in 2022 in my future vision, coronavirus is done. <laughs> it's over. Anyway, uh, there was more to it, but it kind of gets personal. And I know that I share a lot about myself in this show, but some things I'm going to keep a little closer to the chest. And I've been talking long enough in this outro. It's kind of crazy how long I've been talking. That's what happens when you get me on with a guest I really enjoy that I find super interesting. And I find it super exciting that you're still listening at this point of my monologuing. But I'll go ahead and wrap it up for you. Thanks for being here and do check out everything Shelly's up to. Thanks to Shelly again for coming on. And I just love you. You're awesome. The fact that we can connect like this, it's totally, totally miraculous to me. I don't know why I just did a weird accent, but that's how I'm feeling. Really, really happy that we have this medium and I'd love to hear from you guest suggestions, book suggestions, just say, Hey, what's up? Maybe even sign up for Patreon. If you're not on it, that'd be pretty cool. I'm going to play us out with some music from Wolf tech, which I'm linking that in the show notes too, from his new album cry for roots, which is uh, pretty appropriate since we were talking so much about healing our ancestral roots and, letting the emotions and feelings of these past lives come through in a way that allows them to fully pass on and pass away and crying is a way of that happening. So cry for roots by Wolf tech. Check that out. And I'll talk to you guys all next week. Lots of good stuff on the podcast schedule and I'm happy to be doing it. So much love. Bye bye. <laughs> <laughs>